Hi, and welcome to your test one review. We're going to cover chapters one, two, and 16 in this review. This is going to highlight some of the important information in areas where you want to focus your studying to make sure you're prepared for the test. So let's start with chapter one. Um, this chapter is on phlebotomy and healthcare. Um, I want you to know, first of all, you do not have to memorize all of the personnel, but there are a few that I want you to make sure you are um, aware of, are comfortable with, and are know. That's gonna be what the difference is between an MLA, an MLT, and an MLS. So of course the MLA is a medical lab assistant, the MLT is a medical lab technician, and the MLS is a medical lab scientist. So again, know the difference between those three. I will point out that the medical lab scientist, the main difference there is that individual is has a bachelor's degree or higher. So they are able to perform, excuse me, higher complexity procedures and testing. And those are the people who may take on the role of administrator or manager of the lab. The other person or people you want to know are the pathologist. So our pathologist can be anatomical or clinical. And this is a medical doctor who specializes in the study of disease. The anatomical pathologist looks at biopsies, um, tissues, et cetera, to diagnose what's going on with this individual. Whereas the clinical pathologist focuses more on blood and body fluids. So again, anatomical, bi um, you know, biopsies, tissues, clinical, blood and body fluids. Both are gonna analyze whatever specimens they're looking at um, and diagnose based on what they see. There also were a lot of regulatory agencies in this chapter. Again, there you don't have to memorize all of them, um, but there are some key regulatory agencies that you do wanna be familiar with because you will see them pop up again and again throughout the course. Joint Commission. So what does the Joint Commission do? Well, in general, they evaluate accredit and certify healthcare organizations and programs. Um, and they they are the they kind of guide quality control measures. CLIA, this is the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendment. This is gonna one of those that you're definitely going to see pop up throughout the course. Um, CLIA 88 established um, or was established to ensure that all labs were meeting the same standards. Um, they wanted to make sure that specifically as it relates to phlebotomists that we're providing better patient care and performing our skills to a certain standard um, so that we have confidence that the lab results that we're getting are accurate and consistent, right? If the results um, of what we're doing as phlebotomists aren't accurate and cons consistent, this can affect the course of someone's care, treatment, and ultimately their life, right? So, um, it's really important. CLIA wanted to make these standards for labs, for phlebotomists, so we know across the board we're meeting certain standards. Um, CLIA 88 also established standards of how we physically do our job. So, and when I mean that, I mean the order of draw, um, the angle of insertion of the needle, and things like that. So take a look through there as well. Some labs are considered CLIA waived. So this was also established with CLIA 88. Um, CLIA waived tests, and we'll have a whole chapter over this later too, are non-invasive test uh, tests that the results pose minimal risks if they're, um, when we get the results. So like a strep test, um, a, a flu test, mono. Um, basically, if a test is deemed to be waived um we have let's think of a, a box of strep tests right okay we get this box of strep tests we run as soon as we open a new package we're going to check make sure it's not expired um there's nothing missing um we're going to run quality control tests on this box of strep tests it's built in inside the box before we start using them on our patients or residents um so CLIA wave tests can be done without the oversight of a big laboratory. All right, so that's kind of the key parts of CLIA. Now, CLSI, which is the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute, um, developed and published national and international standards for laboratory tests and procedures. They actually follow the CLIA 88 mandates and standards. But it was CLSI who categorized standards into three different phases, okay? So pre-examination, examination, and post-examination. 
So which phase do we fit into as phlebotomists? Well, we fit into the pre-examination phase. You may also see this called, called the pre-analytical phase. So make sure to review that as well. Um, CDC, that's an important one. CDC stands for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The CDC is there to keep the public safe. They also help to establish what tests can be considered CLIA waived. Finally, CDC is gonna classify tests as moderately or highly complex. So when these tests are then de uh, defined as either moderately or highly complex, th this is gonna determine who can actually do what in the laboratory. Remember I talked about that MLS, the medical laboratory scientist, who they're performing the higher complexity tests. So CDC is categorizing them and that determines who can run them, perform them, et cetera. So let's talk about some of the things that we do as phlebotomists, our role, right? Well, obviously we are collecting, processing, and transporting specimens. That's actually what is the pre-examination or pre-analytical phase, the collection, processing, and transportation of specimens. But that's not the only thing we do as phlebotomists. Um, I, I like to remember, or I like to think of, you know, let's say we're working in the hospital setting. If I'm going into a patient's room, I want to kind of consider the reality that this may be one of the worst days of their lives, right? They're in the hospital, they're feeling terrible. Um, so I go in thinking that that could be the case because I'm not only a phlebotomist to collect and draw specimens, but I'm establishing relationships with patients. I'm advocating for my patient. Um, I'm building trust with my patient and I'm responsible for patient safety, just like everybody else. So we're not only responsible for the safety of ourselves and our coworkers, but also our patients. And this is in the moments before. So gathering the right supplies, making sure we have the right order um, to the moments during the draw, right? Obviously we're keeping our patients safe during that time um, to the moments after. So applying pressure to the site where we just did venipuncture, um, making sure the patient feels okay and safe before we leave. Um, so again, it's from getting the order, making sure we as phlebotomists understand the order, um, asking the patient if they have any questions, being compassionate, empathetic, respectful, and of course providing dignity for all of our patients. Um, so our scope as phlebotomists is much greater than just drawing samples, right? So in this chapter, we also talk about point of care testing. So what is that? Point of care testing is care that is done at the bedside or in, at an established workspace. A great example of point of care testing is glucose testing, right? So if you can imagine, if you've ever seen in the hospital, you have a CNA most likely a nurse assistant in this case. Um, sometimes it may fall to the phlebotomist, but in the hospital setting, it's usually the CNA. They have a, a blood glucose monitoring device and they go from room to room collecting this sample, right? So this is a point of care test. When we're doing point of care testing for this reason, safety is one of the biggest concerns. So infection prevention, um, we have to do hand hygiene, wear proper PPE, um, and you're gonna talk more about uh, PPE and hand washing in class, of course, if you haven't already. Um, but this is something, again, we have shared equipment um, with point of care testing. So we have to be really aware of infection prevention. Let's see. Um, the last kind of main topic of chapter one was dealing with how we present ourselves as phlebotomists. So when we walk into a patient's room or when we're about to walk into a patient's room, um, what do we need to do? Well, we need to have good posture, present ourselves professionally, um, introduce ourselves, and tell them what we're going to do. We should never walk into a room rushed, um, flustered, uh, not tell somebody who we are or what we're doing and just start doing it. Um, again, imagine these patients are having the most terrifying experience ever, right? They're in a hospital. They feel like crap. Um, they want to have faith and trust in us that they know who we are and what we're doing and that we know how to do it properly. Um, we want to make sure that we have all of our supplies ready to go before we walk in that room. Of course, we're going to wash our hands before we get started and always ask the patients if they have any questions before we proceed. Um, now, making sure we have all the supplies we need is important. 
there are definitely going to be times as a brand new phlebotomist that you realize you left something out on your cart or you forgot something. Don't worry, that gets a little easier with time. All right, so chapter two um, is all about safety and preparedness. So first of all, um, there's a, a lot of signage going on in this chapter, right? Um, but we, it's important to remember that as phlebotomists, we're working with biohazards, we're working with chemicals and solutions, um, and we need to know what the hazards or potential hazards are in our work environment, both to ourselves and our patients. Um, so there are a few um, signage, signages, signs <laughs> that I want you to focus on. And let me, bear with me for a moment, I should have had these pulled up already, but let me get um, them pulled up. Uh, and you'll likely be going over these in class as well. Bear with me here. Okay, let's see. Almost there. There's three of them. Oh, well, where's the third one? So let me share uh, this first one with you. Let me see if that's in how it goes. Yeah. Share. Okay. So I'm going to point out to you the three um, signages that I want you to make sure you are comfortable with, familiar with. Okay. This one right here is the HMIS label. If that's that habit, uh, you want to focus on the the blue, red, and orange, and white bars, and make sure you know what that represents, right? So if you see the orange, it's a physical hazard. If you see red, it's a flammability issue, etc. okay? So go ahead, and if you want to do a screenshot of that or something, or obviously note what uh, minute we're at in the lecture so you can come back to this, but this is also in your text um, and something that you can review in person. All right, let's look at the next one. The NFPA diamond, uh, again, in your text, you basically, with this one as well, want to know what the colors mean. So red is a fire hazard, um, what, uh, blue is a health hazard, yellow instability, et cetera, okay? Give you a second to just take a quick look at that. All right, and then the last one that I want you guys to make sure to review is the Hazardous Materials Identification Index. This one, you got a lot going on. And actually you have a little bit uh, here of the um, HMIS label in this uh, bottom left corner. Um, but here's the hazard index. You can see in the top left, severe hazard, serious, moderate, et cetera. And then um, personal protection index. So equipment that's needed depending on what type of hazard it is. So you don't have to memorize these labels necessarily you just want to be familiar with them and i do recommend knowing what the colors mean in those last two labels that we looked at okay all right so let me close that down all right um what else do we want to do okay so let's talk about some other hazards okay so when we're working as phlebotomists, probably the first thing you think of as a risk or hazard to ourselves is being stuck, a needle stick injury, right? Which is a bloodborne pathogen exposure, potentially. Um, we're faced with this potential risk daily at our job. Um, what is important to know is that if we get stuck by a dirty sharp, the first thing we're gonna do is clean the area. The next thing we're gonna do is notify a supervisor and follow policy and procedure. Now, I wanna point out how important it is that you don't um, wait till the end of the day to notify a supervisor. So you stick, if you get stuck with a dirty needle or sharp, clean it, notify the supervisor, because what's gonna be really important 
if we get stuck by a contaminated needle, for example, is that we make sure that that patient whose blood was on that needle gets tested for the appropriate um, things that need to be done before they leave, right? So I work in an area at the hospital where we are in charge of following and following up on these um, exposures. Um, so what has happened occasionally um, is we'll get a call at the end of the day and they say, well, I got stuck this morning and we'll ask, well, did you follow procedure and policy? Did this, the, it's called the source lab, is the person who's, whose blood was on the needle, the patient. Um, did you get their blood collected so that we can run the appropriate tests? And they'll say, oh no, that patient went home already. Well, that's a problem um, because we need to get that blood to know if that if the employee is even at risk of, of getting anything. Um, the main things that we're looking for, of course, HIV, hepatitis B, and hepatitis so please, if you ever get stuck at needle at, at work, excuse me, I hope it does not happen. But if there's a potential to blood or body fluids in any way, make sure that you clean the area, notify a supervisor, and ensure that that uh, patient whose blood you or body fluids you've been exposed to um, is tested appropriately by uh, policy and procedure. And your supervisor should help you through that process. Um, okay, so let's see. So. You want to be familiar with for your test the Needle Stick Safety and Prevention Act. Um, this was done. This act was created to keep us safe. You want to review this. Um, this the Needle Stick Safety and Prevention Act mandated that we use safety devices. Um, it says if a safety device is available, use it and use it properly. Um, this act also told us things like do not recap needles um don't stick someone and then put the sharp on the bed no 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 if you stick someone as soon as that sharp you know comes out of that person you are directly immediately putting into a sharps container there's no in between right you want to um, always engage safety devices and immediately put in a sharps container and speaking of sharps container are you familiar with those so we have um Sharps containers. So NIOSH, which is the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, um, created standards for Sharps containers. And you do actually need to know this. So NIOSH said that Sharps containers have to be functional, accessible, visible, and accommodating. So I'm going to briefly tell you what each one of those means. Functional means that all Sharps containers must be leak and puncture resistant, the appropriate size, and durable. NIOSH said that they must also be accessible, which means that they must be easy to operate and reach, not behind, um, for example, a sink where, you know, if you had a sharp that you needed to dispose of immediately, but somebody happened to be there washing their hands, that, that's an obstacle. It's not accessible. So it can't be somewhere where it could potentially be blocked from being accessed. Um, so no obstruction. NIOSH said it needs to be visible, which means there's a visible fill level that you don't go above and it has a visible, clear biohazard symbol on it. Finally, NIOSH said that all sharps boxes and containers need to be accommodating, which means that they need to be easily trained, stable where they're mounted, and anybody can learn how to use it. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I, I primarily was referring to um, needle sticks. Like, let's say you get stuck in the finger after you've uh, done a procedure or a um, drawn in a lab, um, we talk about the first thing you do, wash hands, tell supervisor, follow protocol, right, in that order. Now, what if you get splashed um, by blood or body fluids in the eyes or mouth? Well, I hinted at this a little bit already, but this is where I, we have eye wash stations, showers, et cetera. If I get blood splashed into my eye, I'm gonna go to the eye wash station immediately and flush with copious amounts of water and then report and then follow protocol and policy. So what I want you to do is familiarize yourself with NIOSH's guidelines and regulations to promote safety. This is a section in your textbook. Again, familiarize yourself with NIOSH's guidelines and regulations to promote safety. So I'm going to move on a little bit. It's still a safety thing, but there are some drugs that are hazardous drugs in general. Now, we still give them to patients in the appropriate setting, the appropriate amount, and the appropriate condition, um, but they can be hazardous to us as phlebotomists. Um, these are things like antiviral drugs or cancer drugs. If we're exposed um, without proper protection to um, some of these hazardous drugs, 
sorry about that. Um, some of these hazardous medications and drugs over long term, we can develop chronic and acute illnesses or even cancers. As a phlebotomist, we can be exposed, and why? Well, if we're responsible as phlebotomists for collecting samples of blood and possible body fluids, those drugs are in the blood and body fluids. So, for example, if you work on an oncology floor as a phlebotomist, you're taking frequent samples from patients who are going to be, at times, on these various medications. So we needed to be aware of the potential risks to us, and more importantly, how to protect Ourselves. And that's where PPE comes in. So we need to need to know how to wear or what is the appropriate PPE, how to dispose and handle these specimens properly to protect ourselves. There are other hazards in the lab lab as well, other than blood and body fluids. Um, the and these also have some diagrams in your textbook that you just want to review over and just be um, familiar with. These are hazards like um, electrical hazards, chemical hazards, fire hazards, radiation, etc. cetera. Um, there's also some really basic ones that we should all be following. Don't run in the lab. Um, don't operate equipment unless you've been uh, trained on how to properly use it. We also need to be um, familiar with fire safety. And the two acronyms that you do need to know for your test are RACE and PASS. So RACE is, if there's a fire, RACE is rescue, activate the alarm, contain the fire as much as possible, um, and extinguish if possible. So that's RACE. Um, PASS is relating to fires and the fire extinguisher. Uh, the acronym stands for pull, aim, squeeze, sweep. So that's how to properly use that extinguisher. Um, let's see, a couple more things. Um, chemicals and fumes. So in the lab, we work with and around chemicals, uh, especially strong acids and bases. So this is something that we need to be aware of as a risk and make sure that we are properly trained how to work with and around these chemicals, these acids and bases, so that we're safe. Fumes, um, these can be all, you know, fumes can be chemicals, acids, bases as well. You'll see when you get into a lab, um, there's gonna be a hood in the lab. And when there's a risk of, when working with samples that they release these fumes, these chemicals, these acids, these bases, we process these specimens under a hood because these hoods are designed to, so you open a, um, a tube and some chemicals, some fumes are gonna be released into the air. Well, instead of these fumes coming at you when you open them, when you're under the hood, these fumes get sucked all the way up to a filtration system. Um, let's see. So in the book, again, some like the chemical, um, the electrical, the radiation hazards, your book goes into these in more detail. So if you haven't, um, well, hopefully you've read through that by now, but definitely just review through those um, different hazards. Another thing you need to know, the last thing I'm gonna mention for this chapter in particular is the SDS, which is the safety data sheet. You do need to know about the safety data sheet for the test. And I'm not gonna go into all the details uh, because of time for review, but I'm gonna tell you what you need to know. You need to know what is contained in the SDS. You need to know where do you access an SDS? And you need to know when do you need to access it. So in what situation, what occurrence do you need to go and access the safety data sheet to get more information? All right, so the last uh, chapter, chapter 16, is what we're going to go over. This one is about professional behavior, stress in the workplace, culture and, diver culture and diversity, and professional communities. Um, so professional behavior, we talked about this a little bit in chapter one. Um, but it's important to have professional behavior so that we can maintain, gain and maintain the trust of our patients and our coworkers. Uh, professional organizations. This isn't maybe something that you've thought of right off the bat, right? Well, professional organizations are an important way to network and to tie and to stay up to date in our professional organization, in our case, phlebotomy, right? Um, a couple examples, there's the National Phlebotomy Association and the American Society for Clinical Laboratory Scientists. Um, it's great to be a member of a professional organization, um, if you can be. You get um, information, I've already mentioned some things, but in addition, you get um, information on the most up-to-date practices 
um, job openings, networking. Um, if you've not used networking in your life, it's great to be someone who networks, right? So let's say you, um, I'll give an example. Let's say you are going to school, obviously, for a phlebotomy and you love it, but your ultimate goal is one day to be a nurse. Well, as you're putting yourself through nursing school, working as a phlebotomist in a hospital, network, get to know the nurses, show them that you're professional, reliable, trustworthy, that you do a good job, you work hard, um, attention to detail, punctual, all those things. Show those nurses that you work with so that when it's time for you to be a nurse and get your first job as a nurse, you now have all these contacts who know and trust you and know you're reliable. Um, and that's going to open doors for potential jobs. So think of always be thinking about networking as well. Um, in this chapter, in chapter 16, they talk about hard skills versus soft skills. Hard skills are trained skills. That's what you're learning in the skills lab, right? You're learning how to do venipuncture. You're learning how to do dermals. Um, soft skills are our personal attributes, our professionalism, our bedside manner. Um, in the lecture, I say this in the chapter 16 lecture, but I'm going to repeat it because I think it's worth repeating. Hard skills associated with phlebotomy are the reason that you get hired, but soft skills are the reason for most terminations. You can have all the hard skills in the world, but if your soft skills are seriously lacking, it's going to be a problem. But it's important to know that just like you can improve hard skills, you can improve soft skills. So don't be if you're like, oh, gosh, um, I don't know how to do how to interact with patients yet. I'm uncomfortable with this. That can be developed and improved over time. So cultural competence is something else we've discussed in this chapter. Um, there are we need to be culturally competent and care equally for all people um, some cultures for example view very young as being not experienced so this is going to take a little longer to gain trust um, if you are a younger person or you look younger it might take a little more to earn that trust of the patient in some cultures too much eye contact is not a good thing um, and can be viewed as disrespectful in certain cultures um, people of Caring for somebody can be more of an issue than it can in other cultures. Uh, so we want to be sensitive to that. What else? Um, personal space can also vary in different cultures. The important thing to take away from this is that when you don't know, just ask. People appreciate being asked how to appropriately, you know, care for their loved ones and for themselves. Uh, risk management. The main takeaway from risk management is that we have to do our job correctly and competently because as phlebotomists, we can hurt people, whether it be permanent or temporary damage. We can um, be charged with negligence or malpractice. So be familiar with those terms, neg negligence and malpractice. You also want to be familiar with basic le legal terms um, like acute, uh, not acute, abuse, battery and assault. Make sure you know the difference between abuse, battery and assault as well. The key to protecting ourselves from legal action, do our job properly and document, 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 document. Okay. Um, the final little uh, section that I'm going to talk about in this review, um, body mechanics, there, it's important for phlebotomists. Um, and so what do I mean by body mechanics? This is our, you know, ergonomics, um, posture, lifting, sitting down to get samples rather than hunching over. So protect your back, be comfortable. Um, review what it means in your text to have proper ergonomics, both at your desk, you know, charting or processing, um, and when you're working on floors at obtaining samples. Um, HIPAA, we're going to talk about more detail in class and later in lecture, but the main thing about HIPAA is that HIPAA has to do with patient privacy and confidentiality. Um, I think that's the main things. That's the end of my review here. Um, if you have any questions at all, of course, always reach out to myself or Kirsten. Um, we are here to help you, help you be successful. Um, so let us know if you need anything else. Otherwise, use this as a guide to review and study for test one. And good luck. Let us know if you need anything else. Thank you.